Devil Never Cry. What is up everyone, it is me Devil Never Cry, and as you can see from the title of today's video, I got to play Final Fantasy 16 once more. For those that haven't seen my first deep dive video when I initially got hands on with Final Fantasy 16, I implore you check that video out as I answer a myriad of questions. To those that have seen that initial video, I want to take the time to say thank you as it's your support that has enabled me access to opportunities such as this. Thanks to the kind people over at Square Enix, I was able to play through an extensive 5 hour session of Final Fantasy 16, and as such, I have plenty of things that I wish to share with you. Alongside my first impressions of what exactly I played, I'll be covering a plethora of other topics, such as Toggle's pedigree system, the active time law system and how it works, whether you can get rid of those damage numbers, if there's even going to be a demo, and so many other questions that you've sent in in regards to Final Fantasy 16 and some of its combat mechanics. But just before we dive into the heart of this, there's a few things that I need to preface. The first of which is that if you're worried about spoilers, then fret not. I will be discussing at length everything that I played, but I'll be omitting certain details to avoid major spoilers. In fact, Square Enix would have my head if I shared any of those with you. All of the footage you're about to see here has kindly been provided by Square Enix themselves to avoid any major drama. I also have to provide a quick disclaimer that I played a preview build, and as such, things may differ in the final version of the game. It's also important to mention that I played the game on performance mode, which prioritized frame rate as opposed to resolution, and I played the game on action mode, which essentially means that I have all of the accessibility features, like auto dodge and auto combo, turned off from the beginning. Okay, with that said, I do want to start at the very beginning, where I played my initial two hours, from the very introductory cutscene of Final Fantasy XVI, all the way until the title drop. So the game opens up with Clive Rosfield, the protagonist, waxing poetic about the world of Valisthea, before it starts in medias res, thrusting you into the fight between the icons Phoenix and Ifrit. But before it can reach a crescendo, or a climax, the game flashes forward to where Clive is a bearer, tasked with assassinating or hunting a specific target as a war rages on in the background. Here, the game transitions seamlessly from cutscene to gameplay as you take control of Clive as he works his way through the Nicer Defile, a area of Valisthea which was once bustling and full of vibrant life, which has now turned to nothing but deadlands thanks to the blight that is spreading across the land. As you make your way through the desolate area, devoid of all life, you can stop and take heed of both Shiva and Titan clashing in the background, blocking each other's attacks and sometimes deftly evading others. It's not long before Trouble eventually finds the group and leaves us on a cliffhanger as the game flashes back to Clive's youth. At the start of this sequence, the game gives you the option of entering a tutorial, where it teaches you the basics of combat, such as attacking, using magic, phoenix shifting, as well as using items. The game gives this an in-world context of Lord Murdoch, a prominent member of the First Shield, testing Clive's metal in combat. After eventually prevailing, you're then introduced to a few key characters, Joshua, Clive's younger brother, and Jill, who is a ward of Rosario, as well as Clive and Joshua's mother, Annabelle, and their father, Elwyn. I won't say too much, but all isn't quite what it seems, and there certainly is trouble brewing in the land of Rosaria. At this point, the game opens up and allows you to explore a small portion of Rosalith Town and Rosalith Castle. And though there is a waypoint that marks the way of the main quest, you are incentivized to explore. At often times going off the beaten path, you'll be able to find hidden items, and at other times, simply by walking ambiently past NPCs or non-playable characters, you'll get a small text box that pops up, which often has some babble or chatter from these NPCs, which will provide some context or some lore as to the world of Valisthea. One interesting detail I spotted walking around town is that not all are equal under the flag of Rosaria. There are people in the world of Valisthea, the world of Final Fantasy XVI, branded as bearers, marked people, forced to work, essentially slavery. You can see this happen in one portion of Rosalith Castle, where you can see a bearer forced to use their magic to fill a fountain with water. Final Fantasy XVI is definitely going for a darker tone, and by having these things happen in the background unquestioned by anyone, without drawing any focus to it narratively, definitely sells the idea of a darker world. As the narrative continues to move swiftly, Clive is then sent off to Stillwind Marshes on a mission, but not before the active Time Laws system is introduced. 
For those that aren't Final Fantasy fans, the name might seem obtuse, but it essentially boils down to a reference of Final Fantasy games of years gone past. As the name suggests, Final Fantasy XVI features an intricate and detailed diary of lore that will provide context for all kinds of characters, locations, and enemies. What's cool about the system, however, is as the active name part of it implies, during any cutscene with a simple press of a button, you're able to pull up the active time lore system that will give you context on everybody that's currently involved in whatever it is that you're seeing. As an example, in one of the cutscenes I saw, I saw a character transfer a portion of magic, I believe, over to an owl before the owl mysteriously disappeared. By using the active time lore system, I was able to find out that these owls were called stalasses. They were magical owls reserved only for nobility and royalty, and they were capable of sending messages across long distances in the form of thoughts. By simply letting curiosity get the better of me and engaging with the game's mechanics, I was able to provide better context for the scene that I was seeing and learn more about the world of Ballistia itself. Getting back on track though, Clive had a quest to undertake over at Stillwind Marshes. I ended up picking this location from a map screen and it loaded in quite fast. It's at this point that the game began to open up as I tentatively traced a path through the foreboding marshes. Flanked by two AI companions, I wasn't all too worried about what we'd be facing. I mentioned that the game opened up slightly at this point, and it certainly did. There were several small branching paths for me to take to eventually get to my destination, and some of them led to hidden items that I wouldn't have found without going off of the beaten path. It wasn't long before we were set upon by a pack of goblins, and after we'd cleaved our way through half of them, even more enemies joined in before the encounter had even finished. During the next encounter, the game decided to up the ante a little by introducing enemies that were capable of using ranged attacks. In this instance, it was goblins capable of using magic. Something that I found quite interesting, however, is that if there was an enemy off-screen who was charging up an off-screen magical attack that was heading your way, the game would give you a small indicator to let you know that an attack was coming your way and that you needed to deal with it quite quickly or get out of the way. After a few more skirmishes and encounters, we eventually faced off against a giant goblin by the name of Gigas. This seems to be a sub-boss or a enemy type that you can encounter throughout several different regions in Velistia, which I'll get onto later, and it doesn't seem like it's exclusive only to the Stillwind Marshes. The mini-boss plays out largely like you'd expect, where you'd have to break its will gauge or destroy its will to fight, before it's downed, allowing you to do a considerable amount of damage. Something interesting, of course, or something that is to be expected, is that if you don't continuously attack the enemy to bring their will down, it will slowly but surely recover. And with the Gigas mini-boss finally laid to rest, and everybody patting themselves on the back for a job well done, then you face the real boss of Stillwind Marshes, which is Morble or as some of you might recognize it as, a Malmro. This writhing mass of tentacles definitely proved to be the trickier of the two bosses. Though I can't lie, a grin certainly did flash across my face as I saw the boss use the bad breath move, and with bated breath, I waited to see exactly what it would do, but it didn't seem to inflict any status ailments uh, that I could see or anything that I could spot, as Clive simply dusted himself off and got back up from the attack. No poison, no confusion, uh, no silence, nothing of the sort. The boss fight was definitely cinematic, however. After whittling its health down at certain intervals, the boss would enter a quick time event where, once successfully completing it, you'd do a fair amount of damage and utterly destroy its will gauge. With the mobile slain, the job is well and truly done at this point and Clive and his cohorts are able to leave. Eventually, during the night, however, calamity strikes and we get to the sequence where we've seen throughout a majority of the trailers. Rosalith is in flames and chaos truly reigns. At this point, we move on to a playable Joshua sequence as we make our way throughout the castle as it's being sieged. Compared to his older brother, Joshua's moveset is fairly limited. He's capable of using powerful fire magic and is able to slash at distant enemies with fire. What I did find somewhat curious, however, is that Joshua is capable of using Kiraga as a heal. Kiraga being the most powerful form of cure magic, it just goes to show the latent power that resides within Joshua that perhaps he may not be able to wield all too correctly just yet. The game also does make it a point to show that Joshua is capable of healing people using his fire, which I guess somewhat makes sense considering he has the power of the phoenix within him, and we all know what phoenix downs are capable of doing in the Final Fantasy series, though I hadn't really thought of it that way before Final Fantasy 16. 
As we've come to know, things go from bad to worse for the Rossfield family, and we finally make our way back to the Phoenix vs Ifrit fight that we had right at the very beginning of the game. This time, however, we play through the fight in its entirety, and it is far more expansive and intricate, so to speak, than what we saw right at the very beginning of the game. And as the fight reaches its final conclusion, and we see the aftermath of what's happened, which I won't spoil for anybody, we get the Final Fantasy 16 title card drop. If I had to summarize that intro in just one word, all I can say is intense. There is a night and day difference between Final Fantasy 15 and 16, a stark contrast as to how they handled their introductions, as well as how they handled the idea of royalty going through trials and tribulations that would eventually set events in motion for the rest of the game. That then brings us on to the second part of the game that I was able to play, which spans from just after the intro with young Clive, all the way into the Greatwood section after meeting Sid, and again, this section lasted two hours. So immediately after we get the Final Fantasy 16 title drop, time flashes forward 13 years back into the present day. Back in the present day, and still in the Deadlands, the fight between Shiva and Titan seems to have stopped for the time being, though remnants of the giant icon battle still lay scattered throughout the lands. One of the cooler things that I saw, quite literally, were giant shards of ice from Shiva that seemed to creak and crackle realistically as you walked past them. From the sounds of footsteps to the little details like this ice creaking, or to the music that played in the background, the sound design and the soundtrack of Final Fantasy XVI were definitely one of the highlights of my play session. After finally finding our target, the dominant of Shiva, and facing off against them in a large skirmish, after somewhat of a crisis of faith, Clive figuratively breaks the shackles that bind him, reclaiming the Rossfield names in his honor, and faces off against Tiamat with the victor deciding the fate of the so-called dominant that they found. After an epic showdown where I absolutely decimated Tiamat and made him question his will to live, Torgal and Sid made an appearance out of nowhere. After finding some common ground, Clive is convinced to join Sid at his hideaway, which just so happens to be located in the middle of the Deadlands, where nobody would come looking, and happens to be the remnants of an old fallen ruin. The Fallen being the old ancient civilization that used to inhabit Velistia before the time of Clive and Sid and all of their compatriots. We come to find out that the hideaway is a bastion for bearers who have managed to escape their life of servitude without dying, before being introduced to key members of the hideaway, such as Blackthorn the blacksmith, who you're able to bring materials to so that they're able to upgrade your gear and weapons, or Charon who you're able to buy new weapons and gear from, as well as sell items to, for Gil. Funnily enough, Karen seems to be the one who's looked after our canine companion Torgal all these years, after he followed Sid home to the hideaway one night. One of my favourite features of Sid's hideaway, however, was the Orchestrion, a medieval jukebox that you can interact with that allows you to change whatever background music is currently playing whenever you're at the hideaway. Though you're fairly limited in your track selection at the very beginning, the implication is that by completing certain tasks, you'll be able to unlock more background music for the hideaway, to truly make it your own. After getting all stocked up and acquainted with the members of the hideaway, we're whisked off to our next quest over at Greatwood. And quite honestly, this next area is the very antithesis to where we were just in, in the Deadlands. Greatwoods is teeming, brimming with life, with fauna, with foliage, a dense wood that can feel quite claustrophobic and also spacious at times, as you see the trees extend up infinitely into the sky to the point where you can't even see the top. Not to mention it's also packed full with enemies for you to wail on to your heart's content, alongside both Sid and Torgal this time around. Whilst I could provide direct commands to Torgal to help synergize our attacks and strategy during combat, Sid went off and spinned his own style of ass kicking whilst we fought. He seemed to be more helpful than a hindrance, didn't necessarily get in the way of my attacks or combos, and sometimes pulled off enemy aggression from me whenever we were fighting multiple enemies. After meandering our way through the Great Woods, we finally came to the boss of this area, Fafnir, which I can only honestly describe as a giant bearded dragon blanketed in a sea of armoured scales. Thankfully, the camera pans out as you fight this boss in a giant chamber, allowing you to see where it is at all times, and the lock-on system is definitely a lifesaver here, and something that you're going to need if you want to keep a track of this boss and ensure you're able to dodge or parry its attacks when needed. One of the cooler, more unique attacks this boss manages to pull off 
is that it spin cycles its way sonic style up the walls of this cavern, running rings around you quite literally until it attempts to dive bomb you. But a well-timed attack from Clive will actually parry this boss, throw it out of balance and slow down time slightly, allowing you to maximize on damage. Definitely a risk versus reward gambit there, as if you mess up the timing you can take an immense amount of damage. At this point, realizing my time with the game was wearing short, I ended up moving on to the third playable sequence that I was able to get my hands on. Loading up a pre-prepared game save from Square Enix, I moved on to the open field 3 read section of the playable session. Immediately upon loading into 3 reads, your eyes are met with a beautiful vista, luscious verdant green rolling hills, packed full of key points of interest and things to explore. And sure, you can technically beeline it straight to your main objective, located around 600 yards away, but why would you want to? During this 3 read section, I was joined not only by Torgal, but Jill as well. I spent the majority of my time in 3 reads exploring the area as much as I could. In some areas, I found hidden items and chests just waiting to be looted, and in others, I found enemies waiting in ambush. Though you can see the majority of the enemies on the field before you approach them to start a combat encounter, some enemies will attempt to ambush you as you go to open a chest. Some enemies will simply choose to ignore you and won't attack you until you attack them first, and you can also run into mini-bosses on the field as well. Gigas, the big goblin mini-boss from the Stillwind Marshes section of the game, makes a reappearance here in 3 reads, in case you didn't get your fill of kicking his ass the first time. I also ended up whacking this big horn with my sword and starting a combat encounter, thinking that I'd just be able to blitz through this enemy and be on my merry way, and how wrong I was. Besides that, however, there are a few key things that I did find out thanks to this 3 reads area. The first of which is that you can encounter side quests naturally. We knew that hunts were going to be a thing in Final Fantasy XVI thanks to previous articles and interviews, but here you can actually run into people throughout the land who are capable of giving you a side quest. One such one that I found here was a trader with an overturned cart and a pair of chocobos who needed me to run an errand for him by taking a package into a nearby city. We obliged him of course, taking the package off his hands, but I didn't get to see just how this quest ended as I wasn't allowed to progress outside of this area. The second key feature that I discovered pertains to a question that a viewer asked me in a previous video, where they wanted to know if Torgal would be customizable. And whilst I didn't see any gear, weapons, items or skills for Torgal, I did find out about the pedigree system. By having Torgal accompany Clive into combat repetitively, you're able to increase Torgal's overall level of pedigree. And once you reach certain thresholds of Torgal's pedigree, you're able to effectively increase his attack potency. The game isn't 100% clear on what exactly attack potency is. It could range from anything to the speed of his attack animations, to the damage his attacks do, to even potentially new skills opening up for Torgal to use on his D-pad shortcut menu. For the time being, the sky is effectively the limit with this pedigree system, but at least we know that it is a thing and that there is some form of synergy between Torgal and Clive that is upgradable. Aside from that, there were also a few other things that I just so happened to notice during my playtime. The first of which was the lack of the subprime ability. From what we know so far, the subprime ability essentially acts as Clive's limit break. Think of it as the devil trigger of Final Fantasy XVI, or Devil May Clive, as people like to call it. I was able to access this ability in the first hands-on session back in February, but it seemed to be omitted here, which likely means that you won't get access to that subprime ability until much, much later. Taking a look once more at the three read section, you'll also notice that I have access to the Icon Garuda's abilities, implying that this scenario takes place after you face off against Benedicta. With that out of the way, it's time that I begin to answer your questions in regards to the combat and mechanics in Final Fantasy XVI, including some things that I missed out in my first impressions video. The first and most common question I get asked is whether or not there's a way to remove the damage numbers that seem to pop up every time you attack an enemy, and after having looked through the entirety of the settings section in the menu, I couldn't find any option that would allow me to disable them. If you find that disappointing or you feel quite strongly about it, I urge you to go ahead and let Square Enix know, as I'm sure they're keen on listening to feedback at this point. The next question I seem to get is in regards to the control scheme, and whether or not it's fully customizable. After having looked through the settings menu once again, I can confirm that there is no way to remap specific buttons to what you want them to be. Instead, the game gives you three different control scheme presets that you're able to switch between. Up next, Iconic Skills. 
Some of you wanted to know whether or not you'd be able to decrease the cooldowns for any of these skills, allowing you to use them more rapidly in combat. After having taken an extensive look at the upgrade tree or the upgrade menu, I could not find any way to decrease the cooldowns whatsoever. Mastering skills, or upgrading them, simply provides different attributes to specific skills depending on what they are, such as more damage, or bigger range, or additional hits in that specific skill, but none of them pertain to actually decreasing a skill's cooldown. The reason they've added cooldowns to iconic skills largely pertains to the balance of the game. By being able to constantly and rapidly throw out powerful skills, you essentially would throw the game's balance out of whack, making each combat encounter quite trivial. And sure, I understand why some people might be frustrated with this decision. After all, this runs contrary with the whole character action slash Devil May Clive aspect that they're going for in Final Fantasy XVI, but it's important to remember this is an action RPG first and foremost, and not a character action game. Moving on to the next question, was there any leveling or customization for your AI companions, such as Jill or Sid? The answer to that is no. Aside from Torgal, who has the pedigree system, there was nothing in the menus that implied or suggested that you'd be able to tweak or customize your AI companions. Up next, how do charged inputs work, and can you charge them up whilst doing other actions? The simple answer to that is yes, but to break it down further, by holding the melee button, you're able to charge up the Burning Blade move, in which Clive strikes quite violently with his sword in a streak of flames, a move that can be used both on the ground and in mid-air. When you move over to magic, however, for example if you have Phoenix Junctioned, by pressing and holding the magic button, the fire command turns into fire. I'd imagine the more you go into the combat, perhaps later in the game, that fire turns into fire, turns into fireaga, perhaps. But those moves can definitely be charged whilst doing other things. You'll have to perhaps mess around with your hands and the way you're holding the controller. Uh, but I was quite easily able to throw out some melee attacks and phoenix shifts whilst charging up a burning blade in the background, uh, and vice versa. Moving on to another question I get quite often. Can you jump cancel in Final Fantasy XVI? The answer to that is yes. I talked about this in my initial video, but just to reiterate, the stomp ability in FF16 allows you to jump cancel, just like in some of your favorite character action games, where in midair, you're able to jump off of enemies, keeping them juggled with all your favorite aerial moves. The difference here, of course, is that you are limited to, once upgrading or mastering the stomp ability, only jump canceling twice in midair. The trickier part about this, however, is actually launching enemies in the first place, as I only found a handful of ways to do so. The first of which is by using specific icon abilities, such as Phoenix's Rising Flames or Garuda's Wicked Wheel, or by using Torgal's Ravage command if the enemies are light enough to be launched. Something curious I did notice, however, is that if you are currently juggling an enemy and you hit them with charged magic, for example Fyra, that attack will actually skyrocket them up to even greater heights, allowing you to phoenix shift up to them uh, and continue wailing on them to your heart's content. Cleaving a path ahead to our next question, elemental weaknesses, and this is something that I absolutely have to address uh, based on recent findings, so to speak. In my initial video, I mentioned that elemental weaknesses were a thing, uh, something that I specifically saw when facing off against uh, Garuda slash Benedicta. Shortly after my video went out, an interview went out I believe with the producer Naoki Yoshida-san, who mentioned that elemental weaknesses weren't a thing, which quite obviously led to a bit of confusion. What I was making reference to was the iconic vulnerability tag that pops up on your combat performance on the right hand side of the screen every time I hit Garuda with specific Phoenix skills during combat. The issue, however, stems from the fact that you couldn't see this iconic vulnerability tag pop up anywhere in any of the footage that Square Enix provided for this initial preview. So with the lack of footage and the comments from the interview, obviously what I was saying was called into question. However, thanks to the recent state of play, we've seen this iconic vulnerability surface once more, specifically when Clive is facing off against Ifrit and using iced based attacks from Shiva. And so you can make the argument that elemental weaknesses might not necessarily be a thing in Final Fantasy 16, but there certainly is some form of subsystem in regards to elemental vulnerabilities, particularly when facing off against icons. And so with that finally cleared up, it feels like a weight has been lifted off of my shoulders and we can move on. What's Phoenix Shift's range like and how does it compare to Noctis's Warp Strike? 
The simple answer to this question is that the Phoenix Shift has a far more limited range than Noctis's Warp Strike in FF15. However, by mastering and upgrading the Phoenix Shift ability, you are able to increase the distance in which Clive is able to Phoenix Shift towards an enemy. Moving on down the list, do you have directional inputs or pause combos in the game? To which I can say no. Certain special moves like the lunge ability or the helm splitter in midair require you to press two buttons at once, being the melee and jump input at the same time, but there weren't any directional abilities that you'd expect from a game like DMC or Bayonetta. And from what I attempted, there were no extra combos you can enact by simply delaying certain button presses. And finally, can you use skills and attacks outside of combat? And the answer to this varies. For example, when I was in the Stillwind Marshes, initially before encountering any enemies, I wasn't able to attack or use skills. However, after that encounter finished up and I could go back to exploring, uh, the game allowed me to attack and use whatever skills I wanted, even though there weren't any enemies present. Subsequently, when I was walking around Rosalith or in the introductory sequence in the Nicer Defile, I wasn't able to use any attacks whatsoever, so I think it largely depends. However, when I was in the three read section in the open field, uh, I was able to attack to my heart's content even when there weren't any enemies around. So I think it really varies just depending on where you are in the game and the context of your surroundings. And so with all of that finally said and done, I can let you know, if it's not quite obvious at this point, my overall thoughts on Final Fantasy 16 after this extensive hands-on session. I'd happily go on record, based on what I've played so far, to say that this is definitely a strong return to form for the Final Fantasy series, especially after the debacle that was the previous installment, Final Fantasy XV. The game takes its time to introduce you into the world of Valisthea and doesn't necessarily drag its feet along the way. It also does a decent job of fleshing out some of the key main characters that you'll need to know if you are to successfully empathise with Clive's quest for revenge. From a gameplay perspective, everything I said in my initial deep dive still holds true. The game feels like it's been competently developed from the ground up with action in mind all along, as opposed to it being a weird amalgamation mishmash of RPG and action that we might have come to know in previous Final Fantasy installments. Of course, I also can't forget to mention other factors of this game, like the amazing graphical fidelity. This game really is a joy to look at as well as play. The beautiful soundtrack, which really heightens every aspect of the game that it pretty much touches. And the superb and eminent voice cast and the, the VO, which kind of really sells the emotional weight of a lot of the conversations that you're going to see taking place throughout Final Fantasy XVI. And I can happily say that if the rest of the game matches the quality that I saw here in my initial 5-6 to six hours of playtime, that this definitely is going to be game of the year. At least for me, most likely for a lot of people out there, even with the stiff competition that Zelda Tears of the Kingdom brings to the table. And with that, we come to the conclusion of this video. Do be sure to let me know what you think, however, down in the comments section below on all of the information that's recently been published today on Final Fantasy 16, and consider subscribing and liking this video, that way you don't miss out on all of the Final Fantasy 16 content that's to come. With all that said and done, it has been me, Devil Never Cry, I'd like to thank all of you for watching, and as always, I'll see you all next video.